borrowed the title of Gavin Martin's fanzine, alternative Ulster for their legendary Northern Ireland punk album. Gavin's just borrowed it back. There's an alternative Ulster where there's no security force. A place without Arlene's RHI or Jerry's Twitter discourse. There's an alternative Ulster where the music is sweet. They pogo away the days there because Walden's heaven is under their feet. There's the alternative Ulster of Terry and my brother Jake. The love you take being equal to the love you make. An alternative Ulster of sundry elations where we came together and felt good vibrations. We would pogo till our feet got tired, then go down to Dublin and get totally wired. Roar for them songs until our throats got sore and then cry out for more, more, more. Characters there were to soak up these bands. Merv the Perv, Tara Winter and the late Freddie Hans. Trouble sailed round every corner and we were tied to the masts. I feared bumping into those guys from the outcasts. They stoked punk fires on the Craig estate where Alwyn's private world lay in wait. On Strachan Green in July, they fanned up the flames. Across the road came Geordie. He played football games. He was a warrior in a shirt of green. The best alternative Ulster we'd ever seen. There was mushrooms growing magic from the ground. Terry played the new tunes and the 60s psychedelic sound. The music kept on rolling down through the years. Though it couldn't conquer death or banish all fears. The loss and the illnesses that come with time. Sins thought to be yours turned out to be mine. That was history and those were the ways Ray was mixed with gold in those olden days. But that's all right. And here's the last line. An alternative must be waving. Now is the time. Martin and Martin Bell with an alternative Ulster 2018 that features on tomorrow night's BBC introducing mixtape. We've just got time to cram in the current water cooler uh, from You Tell Me before the BBC News. Thank you. 
Tell Me. We're in session for Mark Riley on Tuesday this week, the 8th of January. Listen back now on BBC Sounds and you can catch them. Hey, 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 Hit me with your rhythm stick by Ian Dury and the Blockheads. My guest tonight is Peter Jenner, and the first part of this interview, Peter, began in the early 80s with Billy Bragg infiltrating Charisma Records by impersing a TV installation man in order to meet you. We then started with your earliest musical encounters and worked our way through Duke Ellington, Pink Floyd, uh, Tyrannosaurus Rex, Roy Harper, The Doors, Blind Faith, Edgar Broughton, and we ended up where we've just uh, started again, Ian Dury and the Blockheads. I I hadn't realised until you told me in the earlier part of this interview that you'd actually produced the uh, New Boots and Panties album, Peter. Yes, well, I never was allowed to have any credit by you, and he ne didn't permit anyone to have any credits. Did you have much of a part in Rhyth Rhythm Stick? Yes, well, Hit Me was the only number one I've ever had, so I'm very proud of that. And I was listed as the producer somewhere, at least the record company, I think, listed me, and, and I got a gold record to put up on the wall. But it was a brilliantly barking mad record as we've just heard. Oh, yes, absolutely. But then it was Ian Jury, so what do you expect? <laughs> <laughs> so, is Black Hill Enterprises still going by the time you're working with Ian? Yes, because we'd been accidentally given some too many royalties and we'd put it into the uh, workhouse studio. So, so, you were not only involved with one punk era legend in, in the form of the Blockheads, but also... I hadn't realised you were responsible for managing the clash around the time of London Calling. Well, it was partly because of um, what we'd done with Ian Jury, that we'd done very well. Ian Jury's agent was also became the clash's agent, and they were just sort of like two or three houses down the road from us. So, and we somehow had, were the landlords or whatever. So that that was how we came across them or they came across us. I'd always thought that The Clash had been managed for their whole career by Bernie Rhodes. Well, they came to us because of uh, they'd just done their first American tour. So The Clash wanted a change. Um, who was it who actually approached you? I think it came from Mick Jones. It came from Mick being on a Philip Rambo record, guesting as a guitar player. And we, we met at the studio, and I think he liked my joints. You know, I rolled a good <laughs> joint, he appreciated it, we were as one. So the sex and drugs and rock and roll as, as an anthem did actually kind of have a heartfelt, emblematic um, Absolutely. part in your career. Absolutely, but I do hasten to add that the drugs were always very herbal and that was all that they ever got to. As I said before, the BBC doesn't condone the uh, taking of recreational drugs in any way? No, I, I would think not. Absolutely so. So, The Clash, what did you think when a band of that kind of stature came and approached you? Well, they came as a result of the agent who had to sort of witness The Clash tour and that had been, I gathered, sort of rather difficult rather chaotic so that's then why we got brought in because the clash's career was beginning to take off in america and um it was very hard to deal with them so at the point at which you became involved they were recording london calling i'd met mick it seemed like a good idea so let's go for it how was the experience? It was great. I mean, and initially it was in the UK and they were very big, So, and there's a, still a lot of spitting going around, so I had my special spitting coat that I used to wear for clash gigs so, so that I didn't have all my clothes covered in spit, but I had an overcoat which was covered in spit. It was literally that bad? Especially at the electric ballroom. Do you know, when, when uh, nostalgia fans at punk festivals... Uh, come up to me and go, you know, it's not, not like the good old days of 78, 79 now. These days it's horrible, nothing. And I, I think wiping spit off my bass guitar strings wasn't my idea no. of fun. Oh, you got spat at as well, did you? Oh, yes, but yeah. uh, quite often in an unfriendly way. <laughs> 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 so, Clash London Calling, the album is acclaimed. Many people still regard it as their best work. Oh, I think so. And I think that we had something somehow to do with it. It was just all working very well, you know, and I think that 
you know, I had little to do with it except to help it along. Brian Eno has written that sometimes, you know, members of a band can be a catalyst, even if they might only play the maracas or apparently be no part of the actual process, but sometimes their presence in the chemistry, the human chemistry of a band environment actually helps make the whole thing happen if you look closely enough. It seems to me that both with the Blockheads and with The Clash you may have had a kind of catalytic involvement. Well, I don't know. I certainly think with The Clash I thought that um, Topper made an enormous contribution because he was, I always felt, as time went on, I continued to feel, he was the best musician in the band. He was the one who could play anything. He was the one who has enabled them to do sort of uh, faux jazz, sort of punk jazz and all sorts of stuff because he was an incredibly good drummer and musician. The rest of it worked well. I mean, i.e. Joe was not much of a guitar player. Mick was a decent guitar player and uh, the bass parts were played mainly by Mick, you know. <laughs> and, and so, and I think Topper was really important in the way he held it all together by providing the sort of rhythmic drive which was so essential to them all. And it, uh, to me it was always interesting that when the clash started imploding, it was when Topper got fired. Wow. You're listening to Six Music, it's Tom Robinson chatting to Peter Jenner about his time at the helm of uh, the, the great machine that was called The Clash in uh, the end of, was it, what, the end of the 70s, beginning of the 80s? Don't ask me. <laughs> Don't ask me, it all fades into, you know, it all goes back there. You know, it's like on those, on the TV screens where it all goes wobbly, you know, and then you go to a different time. The rain and the crunch of things. The ice is coming, the sun's zooming in. Meltdown expected, the wheat is going in. Engines stop running, but I have no fear, cause London is drowning. I live by the river, to the imitation zone. Forget it, brother. Draw another breath, London calling, and I don't want to shout. But while we were talking, I saw you nodding out. London calling, see, we ain't got no hide, except for that one with the yellowy eyes. The ice is coming, the sun's zooming in, engines stop running, the wheat is going thin, a nuclear error. But I have no fear, cause London is drowning.
From 1979, that's London Calling by The Clash. We looked it up while that was playing, and uh, it was the end of your 70s part of your career. Shortly after that, you were no longer working with Andrew as Black Hill Enterprises. When it started to disintegrate, I was uh, with The Clash pulling out, um, and there were sort of problems because... You know, the cash never had any cash, you know, and it was all held very carefully by the record company. So we knew there was money coming, so we extended credit, but we never got paid. With the loss of Black Hill, was that the point at which you then went to work at Charisma Records? Yes, because I had to find a job. And so then I went and got a job at Charisma Records. Yes, absolutely. I got, on, I got on my bike and <laughs> rode to Wardour Street to go to Charisma. <laughs> now, that was founded by Tony Stratton-Smith. Yes. It, again, a legendary 60s label, I think. Well, it was, was, oh, was God, it was when they started. Probably 60s when they started, yes. And that was working also with Peter Gabriel and Gail Coulson. His manager was still in Charisma, so there were some wise heads around there. And Strat, of course, was nobody's fool. Who else was on the label at that time? Gabriel and the Genesis were the key parts. And then there was, of course, Monty Pye which they didn't do much with but they kept selling you know in other words they'd made the records and they weren't a recording artist but the records kept selling and so that that was very valuable to them so that then brings us to the point at which we came into the original interview with Billy Bragg blagging his way in to get to meet you because he's heard you might be a good manager for him yes he was sort of right wasn't he yes I think so because I think I had enough experience by then, having sort of been involved a bit with um, with Dylan's management people, or actually it was the, one of the people who had been spun off from it, really. But she, Mary Martin, she was she was lovely, but and that had given me some ideas about how it worked with singer songwriters and what the difference, in a way, between that and and the band. And it wasn't too long before Charisma itself got into trouble and uh, went well, down the tubes. Yeah, yeah, but before that, you see, I'd started working with Roy Harper, which was very important, at EMI, so there was sort of overlap. That, again, was very important in terms of making records and promoting artists and all the rest of it. I mean, he was, he was fairly hot, but not quite hot enough. <laughs> not a critical mass. Not a critical mass. I mean, his records were great. People loved his records, and I think some of his records are still seen as, certainly Stormcock, I think, is still seen as a classic recording, and I think it was very innovative what we were doing there with Jimmy Page and Harper and uh, John Leckie. Now that we're actually talking about it, we should actually play a track from Stormcock, and yes. uh, uh, according to the online reviews, uh, the, the one that uh, Roy rated as featuring Jimmy Page in a particularly outstanding way was same old rock we'll hear it after this <laughs> hello. hello 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 music lover eclectic and esoteric kind of fun loving quite a lot of boasting <laughs> radcliffe and mcconey i have no idea what is around the corner but i'm ready for it it's a life of surprises isn't it Six, music. what first made you fall in love with music bruce springsteen says when he first heard like a rolling stone by bob dylan it was like someone kicked the door open in his mind oh. It sounded like the future. What can we expect from Weekend Breakfast on Six Music? High octane thrills. High quality tunage. Thought provoking chat. All those things seem pretty good to me. <laughs> this is Radcliffe and McConey. Back tomorrow morning from 7 on BBC Radio Six Music. Six Music. This is the Tom Robinson Show. BBC Radio Six Music. With consternation, but you have found me a brand love, and you try to warn me that there's only one kind.
extract from Same Old Rock by Roy Harper, featuring Jimmy Page from the 1971 album Stormcock, which was masterminded, is it fair to say, by tonight's guest, Peter Jenner? No, 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 I, was I sat there and grooved. <laughs> <laughs> that was my role, was to sit there and groove. So, here we are, we've got you to Charisma Records in the early 80s, in the wake of the collapse, for no fault of your own, of Black Hill Enterprises. Yes. And while you're at Charisma, your wife, who we haven't brought into the story up to this point, but who's been with you since the uh, mid-60s, I believe. Oh, yes, she Sydney. was with me all the way through the, uh, my initial music career. Absolutely, she was, she was there and put up with me and put up with the musicians and the Floyd playing in the front room and, and even actually, yes, going up to Abbey Road and hanging out. And my Japanese-Canadian late wife, uh, Sumi, was uh, bumped into Yoko in Abbey Road, which is always, I, I wish I'd seen it. But the idea, they came around the corner and there was another Japanese woman. How dare you? How, what is this? <laughs> what has happened here? <laughs> and they ignored each other. Fan it was classic. Fantastic. fantastic. Nothing to see here. <laughs> Nothing to see here. So, I first met Sumi as a partner with you in Sincere Management. Yes. Um, when did Sincere begin and why? Well, Black Hill went down the tubes because The Clash not paying us the money. We'd built up all these overheads with accountants and all the rest of it to keep the system going. So we had two big bands on the road. So there was a lot of admin. And uh, we hadn't bothered to collect any money from The Clash because they'd be nice guys, they'd be sort us out, you know. Then when The Clash left, we said, well, can you give us some money? And they said, no. forget it. <laughs> you know, and I mean, I, I was, uh, should we sue them? And I thought, no, I really don't want to be involved with suing artists for money. And it's just going to be a question of throwing mud at each other. Forget it. And so we just had to write it off, and it meant that we had to leave. So I lost... When we left, we left very suddenly, but so all the sort of Floyd stuff that we had left over were all just abandoned. We just left, it was like, oh God, it was just so depressing when we went bust that we just thought, oh, we just have to get out of here. We had to go into liquidation, forget it. So that stuff would be worth a fortune. Then. Oh, I mean, I could retire on that very easily. I mean, there'd be posters and tickets and all sorts of stuff, but it all went. Wow. So then, how did you rebuild with Sumi? We'd had, a, as a result of this, we had a house. We had somewhere to live. And by then, we also had kids. And so we set up an office in the house, you know, to keep me busy. It's so occupational therapy. And into that, we acquired Billy Bragg. Uh, I'd met Billy at, when I was working at Charisma, so it overlapped with being at Charisma. And also Hank Wangford, who was an old friend, but he too became involved with, with what we were doing at Sincere. That's when we became Sincere. Now, Sincere Management and Hank Wangford um, were kind of natural bedfellows. Yes. Uh, we did steal the name from Hank. <laughs> yes. We, uh, he, he started the Sincere things and so we thought sincere management be appropriate since he had sincere products and sincere records and so on and he was all about sincerity because Hank Wanford was a country artist and of course as you as we all know country artists are professionally sincere I remember first seeing him at a small festival in Norwich in, oh, a, yes. in a park uh, yeah. I mean just Completely randomly, this guy in a Stetson comes on and singing bizarre songs and then giving homilies to the audience about how there are no strangers, just friends you haven't met yet. <laughs> yeah. It was fantastic. Hank was a very good old friend of mine from early, early. My, he, 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 I knew him by my first girlfriend who, who had been his neighbour. And so I'd known Hank all the time I'd been at Cambridge and, and from before that. And so... When he became a, uh, you know, a country star, it was inevitable that I would become involved in, in his career and I wasn't able to do anything for it. It was what it was. The demand... Music people don't have a sense of humour in general terms and, and, and humour people don't really appreciate music. So Hank being a sort of very witty, uh, you know, comedian stroke artist was a very difficult road thing. Interestingly, he's still doing it. There was a small but perfectly formed audience for Hank around the world or around the UK. Well, let's hear a Hank Wangford song at this point. The one that I remember from that little park in Norwich in the, I think, late 70s. Yeah. Um, 
was cowboys stay on longer. <laughs> Hank Wangford with Cowboys Stay On Longer, a complete classic of its genre. Uh, Peter Jenner, Hank Wangford has an alter ego and is also known as a kind of leading gynaecologist under the name of Sam Hutt. He's also one of your oldest friends. My first girlfriend introduced me to him way back when and um, he was also the sort of a, a leading doctor for, for musicians. He did a lot of doctoring for musicians early on. We did a TV series for him with the Channel 4. So Hank was, is a much underrated uh, person, I think. Were there any mod-influenced guitar-smashing R&B bands that he might have doctored for? He definitely worked with The Who, I'm sure, yes. Well, the important thing was that Hank gave us some revenue to get sincere management going. Sumi was there, my wife was there, and, and, and we had to try and put it all together again. And, and so we worked with Hank, and then Luckily, as the, at that time, also Billy Bragg walked into our lives. Sumi was a magical person and really, I imagine, must have been kind of very much the life and soul of the office at, at that time. She had a great sense of humour. Yes, and uh, she was just a lovely person, was organised, because in this, uh, you know, organisation is not my main thing. And um, she kept it together. Let's move on to another act dear to my heart from that early time at Sincere Management, and that's Frank Chickens, who uh, also managed to get a Channel 4 series of their own. What was the deal with Frank Chickens? Somehow or another, through their record company, we found each other, and, and, and because Sumi was a Japanese-Canadian and they were Japanese, I mean, there was obvious sort of solidarity going down there. But their, their shows were, like, hilariously sort of chaotic, two Japanese yes. women on a, on a stage. With, with heavy accents. I always thought those were put on. I thought they no, no, exaggerated no. I mean, them. No, no, no. They were pretty heavy accents. They probably weren't smoothed out like they might have been had they worked, been working in an office, you know. But it was a combination of being totally surreal but also having quite an edge to it. Yes, and they, and they, they managed to do some records, which I'd picked up, you know, they, they came along to me. But in a sense, they were always a problem because they, were, they weren't great singers and they weren't great songwriters but their stuff was really good, <laughs> you know, so they were, were they uh, cabaret or were they musicians or, and that was always a difficult balancing act. And uh, I think that balancing act still continues for Casaco. God knows what she is, but she's very talented and it's very varied and it's a bit of this and a bit of that and it's all good. And her music continues to have an afterlife on Spotify and by far the most popular track is the one we're about to hear next. Six. This, this is BBC Radio Six Music. Six Music. Six Music. Six Music.
Extraordinary Frank Chickens and We Are Ninja, which I believe Kazuko still performs live to this day. Oh, yes. <laughs> Absolutely. That's, it's been remixed. It's, it's and we still see her, you know, and she's an, she's an old friend by now. Fantastic. Family friend. Let's look at a few more of the artists who have been involved in the Sincere Management stable. A um, friend of mine, Andy White, uh, we have kind of knew in his Cambridge days, or just after his Cambridge days, uh, with John Wesley Harding, who was a mate of his oh, yeah. at Cambridge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, how did you get involved with Andy White? Well, I guess it was because of Billy, you know, in the sense that if you're a solo singer-songwriter, you know, then who'd, who's Billy's manager? Because Billy was doing very well, so let's try and hang out with... So that's, I think, how I got involved with Andy White, because he, he came in with his Irish stuff and I, I, his Irish vibe, his Northern Irish vibe, and I really liked his stuff. And somehow I think both he and I thought that, you know, with what I'd learnt with Billy, we, you know, we could do the business, but it never, commercially never worked. I think he was a good singer-songwriter, but his identity was never as clear as Billy's identity as working class, man of the people, lefty. There were all these things which sort of made him someone of interest to a lot of people. And Andy White, you either liked his records or you didn't, and it wasn't a big hit, so, you know, who would hear the records? Yeah. I guess the closest Andy came to that was with religious persuasion. Yes. And that was really a fierce song from his home background. Let's hear that after this. <laughs> Hello. 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 Hello, music lover. Everybody that works here is obsessed with music. Sean Keaveney. How is it some of the most iconic artists are able to reinvent themselves? Very kind of you to say so. You don't mean me, do you? Six. Music. Music 